Uh, good evening. My name is Becky Liner. I'm the Executive Vice President of the James Madison Institute. And uh, as part of my job as EVP, I also am the director of our Center for American Ideals. And through that center, we, um, we do outreach to students from elementary, uh, elementary school all the way up through college. And our uh, event tonight is sponsored in part by our campus representative program. And JMI for six years now has had the camp campus rep program. We've been on as many as 14 different campuses in Florida. We're currently on eight. And the event tonight is co-sponsored uh, by all eight of our campus reps at, uh, we have them at Florida State, University of Florida, Jacksonville University, University of Central Florida, Florida Southern, Florida Atlantic, Rollins, and uh, Ave Maria. And I hope I didn't miss anybody. Um, they're all on the call tonight. Many of their peers from their campuses are also on the call. And uh, we, uh, we were very fascinated to discover there was such an interest in criminal justice reform by college students. So Jeff, we really appreciate you being with us here tonight. I think it's gonna be an interesting conversation. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Sal Nuzo, who is JMI's Vice President of Policy. Take it away, Sal. Thank you, Becky. And uh, thank you all very much for joining us. I'm looking at the participant tally and I'm really excited for how many folks have joined us this evening. Um, as Becky had mentioned, I have the pleasure of serving on the policy team. And one of the areas that JMI has focused on over the last five or six years has been the issue of criminal justice and policing reform. Uh, we started off a, a few years back looking at some of the policies state level uh, that impact juveniles that come into contact with the criminal justice system. And we've expanded into uh, the impacts of sentencing laws, uh, things along the lines of uh, compassionate release over criminalization and, and a number of other uh, areas that uh, our criminal justice uh, system uh, kind of functions in Florida. And so tonight we have really the pleasure of hearing a great presentation uh, from Jeffrey Deskovic. Uh, he is going to tell us his story. You'll have an opportunity to engage with him. Uh, the way that this, uh, this evening will work is I'm going to introduce Dr. Uh, Dia Quinlevin in a, just a moment who will uh, kind of introduce uh, Jeff and kind of take it from there. After uh, Jeff is done with his presentation, we'll have an opportunity to, uh, to ask questions. Although uh, with the number of folks that we've got on the uh, panel, you do have a Q&A box if you'd like to submit a question and we'll get to that. Uh, we are going to uh, kind of try to put preferences on uh, questions that are submitted from college students uh, in, in hopes that we can get to as many as possible. So if you do submit a question in the Q&A box, please uh, indicate your name and uh, the college that you represent. Uh, but with that, I'm going to introduce Dr. Dia Quinlevin, who's an associate professor of psychology at Florida Southern. Uh, she graduated from the University of Alabama at Huntsville uh, with a, a bachelor's in psychology, a master's in experimental psychology, and then she got her doctorate in social psychology from Iowa State. Uh, she's a noted wrongful convictions expert, and she's uh, been frequently cited by the Supreme Court of the United States. And she's going to kind of introduce Dr. Uh, or introduce Jeff and kind of take from there, and then we'll come back on the tail end for Q&A. But Dr. Quinlevin, it is all yours. Thank you very much, and thank you all for showing up. Um, so before I get into introducing Jeff, I do want to share how I met Jeff and how impactful he has been in my life because I really feel like it gets to cross like what an what a important and amazing person he is. So I met Jeff um, in 2007 at a conference in New York where he was the key speaker. He had just been exonerated um, just a couple of the year before. And so we both got invited to the same dinner and I arrive everywhere early, um, apparently so does Jeff. So Jeff was there already and I asked if I could sit beside him. And through that unique opportunity, I was able to really get to know Jeff on a personal level and ask him 
questions that actually changed the trajectory of my entire career, right? So I knew I wanted to work with eyewitnesses, but he really solidified in me that I wanted to work for wrongful convictions and to help overturn wrongful convictions and to help prevent wrongful convictions. And so I really kind of owe it all to Jeff that I continued that line of work. And so I do want to thank you for that, Jeff. And I, I know you know that I think that, but I think it's important other people know how impactful you are too. So Jeffrey Deskovic is an internationally recognized wrongful conviction expert. Um, he's also the founder of the Jeffrey Deskovic Foundation for Justice, which has freed um, eight wrongfully convicted people and passed three laws aimed at preventing wrongful conviction, including videotaping interrogations, identification reform, and DNA database expansion. Uh, Jeff is an advisory board member of the coalition group, It Can Happen to You, which passed the country's first commission on prosecutor conduct, which was an independent oversight board for prosecutors, and he helped pass discovery reform. The coalition group has chapters in New York, Pennsylvania, and California, which Jeff is active in. And the issues are focused, focused on include oversight for prosecutors, exoneree compensation, and capital punishment. He also serves on the Global Advisory Council. Member, he's a member of Restorative Justice International. Jeff's body of work includes delivering over 200 presentations across the country and internationally. He's authored more than 200 articles and he has nine published publications. Um, in different journals. He um, has participated in uncountable television, radio, print media, and news media interviews. He's lobbied um, elected officials. He's testified in legislative hearings. Jeff has twice co-taught a wrongful conviction college class at Rockland Community College. He is an, a certified instructor in the New Jersey Police Academies. So Jeff has actually instructed 12 soon to graduate classes of police cadets on the topic of ethics and best practices. Jeff has served as continuing legal educator instructor on five occasions in front of judges on various wrongful conviction topics, as well as delivered continuing legal education instructions to four groups of lawyers entitled Tips for Trial Lawyers from an Exonerated Man in Law School. Jeff also provided continuing legal education instruction to civil lawyers, covering a framework for evaluating innocence claims and assessing the viability of exoneration. Jeff's endorsement has been, it has been given in, in 10 different political races, which involve wrongful conviction and justice reform as a policy plank. Jeff has a bachelor's degree in behavioral science from Mercy College, from which he got a scholarship, and a master's degree from John Jay College of Criminal Justice, where his thesis was written on the causes for wrongful conviction and the changes needed to address those causes. In May 2019, he obtained a law degree from Elizabeth Hobbs School of Law at Pace University in pursuit of his dream to exonerate others as an attorney. He was recently admitted to the bar as an attorney. Um, Jeff is also a producer of the movie, The Survivor's Guide to Prison. And he's a producer and consultant on the show, 360 Degrees of Success. Working in collaboration with New Yorkers against the death penalty, Jeff played a major role in warding off efforts at re reinstating the death penalty in New York in 2007 and was part of the effort which legislatively abolished the death penalty in Connecticut with the Connecticut Network Against the Death Penalty. Jeff is co-owner of the Recharge Beyond the Bars, uh, re, sorry, Recharge Beyond the Bars reentry game, which assists formerly incarcerated people with reconnecting with friends and family. The foundation, the Jeffrey Deskovic Foundation, and Jeff used their public platform to give a voice to other important criminal justice issues when opportunities have presented themselves. The foundation was the only innocence organization which weighed on the issue of parole reform at the United at the New York State Legislators hearing in 2013 when Jeff testified there on the behalf of the organization. 
He has written extensively about prison reform, such as college education for prisoners, parole reform, and prison reentry. And a recently released documentary short on his life entitled Conviction, which has won prizes in 10 different documentary film festivals, is also and is also available on Amazon Prime. Jeff can be seen discussing the elderly in prison, medical care, um, compassionate release, and demanding that society do better. Jeff has also spoken out about solitary confinement, mass incarceration, and ban the box. In recognition of his advocacy work, Jeff has received several awards, um, including Public Sector Servant of Justice from It Could Happen to You, the 2018 Dist Distinguished Alumni Award from John Jay College of Criminal Justice, the Sobri Pasternak Award, which is given to the law student who contributed the most to civil rights while a student, the Humanitarian of the Year Award by the New Rochelle Chamber of Commerce, the New Yorker of the Week um, by the television show New York One, the Conquest Award by Unlabeled Awards, the Agent for Change Award by Hudson Valley Reentry Network, and most recently, the Advocate of the Year by Citizens Against Recidivism. Jeff's motivation stems from the fact that he was wrongfully convicted of murder and rape and served 16 years in prison from the age of 17 to 32. Jeff's wrongful conviction happened despite a negative DNA test result and was based upon a coerced false confession, prosecutorial misconduct, fraud by the medical examiner, and an, an inept public defender. He lost seven appeals and was turned down for parole before being exonerated by further DNA testing via the DNA data bank that identified the actual perpetrator. His life is dedicated to fighting wrongful conviction and working for the criminal justice reform. So let's give a warm welcome to Jeffrey Deskovic. Thank you very much. As was mentioned, um, I was um, wrongfully convicted of, uh, of uh, murder and rape. The year was 1990 and it was in Westchester County, New York. It was think suburbs, think middle class, think ethnically diverse. Um, murders were pretty rare. So when this murder happened, it understandably created an atmosphere of fear, rumor, paranoia. Parents were concerned with their own safety as well as the safety of their children. In high school, I was quiet. I was to myself, I didn't participate in very many organized sports. This made me seem strange to the kids in the high school. In the course of the police investigation, the police interviewed many students from the school. And some of them told the police that they might want to speak to me because I didn't fit in. This is what the police said initially attracted them to me. Another factor was that they said that I was overly upset at the victim having been murdered. They felt that my being uh, sentimental and emotional was an outward sign that I was sorry for what I had done. An additional reinforcing factor was that the Peekskill police got a psychological profile from the NYPD, which purported to have the psychological characteristics of the actual perpetrator. And I had the misfortune of matching that uh, profile. Before I, was a, before I was a teenager, I wanted to be a police officer when I grew up. So that directly intersected with the police uh, technique, good cop, bad cop, otherwise on this Martin Jeff, which is when one officer takes on a more aggressive role, whereas his partner pretends to be opposed to what's going on, but somehow powerless to intervene and pretend to be a friend. My father was never involved in my life in any capacity. I never saw him. And so again, that intersected with that good cop, bad cop technique. I looked at that officer who was pretending to be my friend, to be like a father figure. Before I was a teenager, I wanted to be a cop when I grew up. So all of my interactions over six weeks, the police played this cat and mouse game where half the time they would speak to me as if I was a suspect and the other half the time they pretended like they needed my help to solve the crime. They would say things like, the kids won't talk freely around us, but they will around you. Let us know if you hear anything. Stop in from time to time. 
they would ask me opinion questions and congratulate me that my opinion was correct. Eventually, they got me to agree to take a lie detector test by telling me that some new information had come in to their file and they wanted to share that with me and that would allow me to be even more helpful to them. First though, I would have to take and pass the polygraph. And so the next day, rather than report to the high school, I instead went to the police station. The police drove me from the city of Peekskill, which was in Westchester County, to the town of Brewster, which was in Putnam County, 40 minutes away by car. That meant I was no longer able to leave on my own. I was instead dependent upon the police. Three officers had came there with me from Peekskill, but then there was also the Putnam County Sheriff's investigator who was the polygraphist. He was dressed like a civilian. He never identified himself as a cop. He gave me a four page brochure, which explained how the polygraph worked, but it had a lot of big words in it, which I didn't understand. But then I pushed past my own concern, reasoning that I was there to help the police. What did it matter? Let's just get on with it. From there, I was put into a small room where the polygraphers gave me countless cups of coffee. Seems pretty clear in hindsight that the purpose of giving me the coffee was to get me nervous. From there, I was attached to the polygraph and then the polygrapher launched into his third degree tactics. He raised his voice at me. He invaded my personal space. He kept asking me the same questions over and over again. As each hour passed, my fear increased in proportion to the time. He kept that up for six and a half to seven hours. Towards the end of the interrogation, he said, what do you mean you, di you didn't do it? You just told me through the polygraph test result that you did. We just want you to verbally confirm it. When he said that to me, it really shot my fear to the roof. At that point, the officer who had been pretending to be my friend, he came in the room and told me that the other officers were going to harm me, but that he was holding them off and could not do so any longer. You have to help yourself here. You understand? Well, considering that I had maintained my innocence for that six and a half to seven hours, it was pretty clear what he meant by that. They wanted me to confess. When it was added, if I did as they wanted, that they'd stop what they're doing, that I could go home afterwards, that I was not going to be arrested, being young, naive, frightened, 16 years old, not thinking about the long term, instead being concerned with my safety in the moment. I was in fear of my life. The fact that I didn't know where I was and that nobody else knew where I was either loomed very large in my mind. I was overwhelmed emotionally and psychologically. And then there was the possibility of harm on one hand. And then there was that false life preserver that he had threw me. So I decided to make up a story based upon the information which they had given me in the course of that interrogation. By the time the interrogation was finished, I had collapsed onto the floor in a fetal position, crying uncontrollably. Needless to say, I was arrested. I was charged with a murder and rape. Now, before I went to trial, the results of the DNA test came in from the FBI lab, which showed that semen found in the victim did a match me. But rather than acknowledge they made a mistake, they instead continued to prosecute full speed ahead. In order to explain away that DNA evidence, the prosecutor got the medical examiner to commit fraud. He suddenly claimed six months after doing the autopsy that he had forgotten to document medical evidence, which he said that showed that the victim, a 15 year old immigrant from Colombia who had been in the country for about a year and a half, leading a very sheltered life. As I understand it, she never went anywhere unless she was accompanied by her older sister and her parents, that she had been promiscuous that she was sleeping around. That is what opened the door for the prosecutor to argue that it didn't matter that the semen didn't come from me, that didn't mean, mean I was innocent. It simply meant that she had slept with yet another person before I had murdered and raped her. Taking it a step further, they named another youth by name that they claimed had slept with the victim, but he never set the proper foundation for that argument. He never asked that other youth to give a DNA sample. They never even called him as a witness to give verbal testimony to that effect. He simply made the unsupported argument to the jury. Seeking to help the prosecutor overcome the negative DNA test results uh, and not content with having coerced the false confession out of me, the police also fabricated a statement and attributed to me. They claimed that I had told them that I didn't know if the victim, assuming if the perpetrator had ejaculated or not. But at 16 years old, that word was not in my vocabulary. And 
in their written accounts of what happened in the interrogation, that statement only appeared in their reports after uh, the DNA didn't match me. When the DNA didn't match me, they did one other improper thing. The police went back out into the field and they interviewed 17 witnesses who knew the victim in one capacity or another. All of them told the police that she did not have a boyfriend. There was no consensual sex. But the police never documented any of those witness interviews. And as a result of that, none of them were turned over to my attorney. So we didn't know that that had happened. At the same time, the public defender essentially didn't defend me. He never called as a witness my alibi. He, I was actually playing wiffle ball and the crime happened. He never even spoke to him. He never explained to the jury the significance of the DNA not matching me. He never used that to argue that it proved that this confession obtained under highly questionable circumstances had been coerced and false. He never cross-examined the medical examiner who, whose fraud was such a big thing in my case. He never should have represented me because of a conflict of interest. This other youth that the prosecutor was falsely saying had slept with the victim was represented by another member of that public defender's office and specifically by the attorney who was supposed to be supervising him on my case. That conflict prevented the defense from asking him to give a sample that prevented the defense from calling him as a witness to explode the consensual sex theory. Lastly, when I was interrogated, my interrogation was not videotaped. It was not audio tape. There was no signed confession. It was simply the officer's word for it. And as a result of that, when they came to court, they were able to leave the threat and false promise out of their testimony. So I wanted to testify and explain to the judge and later to the jury what happened in the interrogation room, but my lawyer wouldn't allow me to testify there. He said it wasn't his job to prove that I was innocent. It was up to the prosecutor to prove that I was guilty. And he didn't think that it happened. That might be a legal principle, but it's a very naive way to practice law. In reality, you have to try to prove that your client didn't commit the crime or else they run a risk of possibly being wrongfully convicted. Particularly in a confession case where there's an 80% conviction rate, you have to answer that confession. You have to explain why it was given. You have to disprove as many elements of that confession as you can, and then bring it all together in your closing argument, except that my attorney didn't do any of that. And as a result of that, I was wrongfully convicted. I'll never forget the day that I was found guilty. I, I felt like I was in a type of nightmarish alternative reality because it, uh, to my way of thinking, at least up until that point in time, only the guilty were convicted. Yet they said what they did and I was taken into custody. I would like to share a few photos because when this happened, I was not the adult that's presenting to you tonight. Here's a, what's happening now. Right, give me one second. I'm having a glitch. Okay, give me one second. Try this one more time. All right, here we go. Sorry. This is my mugshot. This is what I looked like when I was in the court after it was announced that the jury had reached verdict prior to the verdict having been made. This is a picture of me in the courtroom when I begged the judge to overturn the verdict because I was innocent and I referenced the DNA to support my contention. He actually told me on the record, maybe you are innocent, conceding that there was a doubt. The DNA didn't match me. How could there not have been a doubt? That didn't lead him, though, to step up for justice and exercise his discretion by overturning the conviction, which he could have done by overturning any number of rulings he had made against me in the course of the trial. Instead, he took the easy politically expedient way out, which was to sentence me to a term of imprisonment of 15 to life. I would like to share with you a little bit about my prison experience. I remember the first day. I remember having on being in handcuffs and having a chain around my waist and having my legs fastened together as well as fastened to the legs of the prisoner on the bus next to me. I remember how large the prison wall loomed, 
and I'm menacing the bar buyer up here. I don't mind sharing with you that at 17, looking like I do in this slide that I have up on the screen, that I was, and, and considering that I was having been charged as an adult and sentenced as an adult, I was sent to a men's maximum security prison. I was definitely frightened. As I walked down the cell garret, there were many prisoners there whose arms were as big as my legs. Didn't take a lot of figuring out on my part to realize that if any of them decided to assault me, that I was not in, uh, there's no way I was gonna be able to uh, defend myself against you know, fully, from fully grown uh, men and adults, you know, many of whom are guilty of having committed very serious um, violent crimes. The guards themselves were obstacles. To be sure, some were professional and did their job. Yet others brought their problems from their home life into the prison, displacing their aggression onto the prisoners. Then there were other guards who even their peers hated because the manner in which they conducted themselves on a day-to-day -day basis made it likely the prisoner to staff violence could occur, which could suck all of them into it. But nobody ever bothered to reel them in, not their coworkers, nor the, nor the people who were supposedly there to supervise them. There was a system of maintaining order in the prison known as keep off, which involved a variety of sanctions being imposed on the prisoners if they were found guilty of having broken the prison rule. Those sanctions included being kept in the cell 23 hours a day out of the 24. They would send you less food. Sometimes the food would be three or four days old. You would be able to take two showers one week and three the next rather than being able to shower daily as the rest of the population. Their idea of complying with the court mandated one hour a day recreation while the prisoners were on that status consisted of putting them in a small uh, caged area with maybe a pull up bar in it if you were lucky. You would not be able to use the phone while you were on that status. There were a bunch of times in the course of my incarceration that I was assaulted, one time in which I nearly lost my life. Beyond dealing with that physicality, I was also subjected to those sanctions. Because in prison, if you were defending yourself, then obviously that means that you were fighting. In my mid-20s, I couldn't bring myself to simply stand there and watch as people I had eaten, drank, and played sports with were assaulted right in front of me. But then the price that I paid for my ethical decision to help defend people was that I was also subjected again to those sanctions. My brother is three and a half years younger than I am, and he also was impacted by my wrongful conviction. The kids on the school bus used, and in the school used to tell him that his brother was a rapist, and they would say other nasty things, and they would try to hit him and stab him with pencils. I guess being unable to get to me, he was the next best thing. When I was originally in prison, my mother used to make the four, four and a half hour trip from Peekskill to Elmira. But as the long trip grew old and things tightened up a little bit financially and uh, she had some problems with her back and, and feet. Uh, I began to see her less and less and until so eventually I was lucky if I saw her uh, once every um, six months. My grandmother passed away while I was wrongfully in prison. So it was the end of my, while I was in prison, I tried to minimize the loss that I was experiencing by, I, I would try to minimize the loss that I was experiencing. I got a GED and I completed an additional year of schooling towards the uh, bachelor's degree, but then even that silver lining was uh, taken from me. Changing gears, I want to share that uh, how it was I came to be exonerated. I mean, I, I did lose seven appeals. Um, the appellate court found that uh, my statements were voluntary. Uh, they ruled that there was overwhelming evidence of guilt, which really didn't make any sense. They ruled against me five to nothing. And it was all downhill from there. The re-argument motion was denied in one word, uh, denied. Uh, the Court of Appeals declined to give permission to appeal to them. I lost in federal court because my lawyer was given the incorrect uh, information pertaining to the filing procedure. And uh, my petition being four days too late was deemed to be more important than my innocence claim. And then the next three courts upheld that ruling. I wrote letters for four years looking for an attorney and investigator to help me because the only way back into court is if you can find some new evidence. Eventually, I wound up with the assistance of the Innocence Project. Their taking my case was the most important thing. The DA who had blocked me from getting further testing and fought all the appeals left office and her successor allowed me to 
have the testing. And lastly, we got lucky that the actual perpetrator, uh, he had killed a second victim three and a half years later after killing the victim in my case. That resulted in his DNA being put into the DNA data bank. And so when we got the testing, it actually, uh, it actually matched him. So showing a few more uh, photos, this is another picture of me in prison. Here's when the conviction was overturned. Here's a, here's a picture of um, me in terms of the reintegration. Let me just mention that um, I, I, while my charges were dismissed on actual innocence grounds, he was uh, arrested and convicted um, of the crime. Very hard to put your life back together again after being wrongfully in prison for 16 years, very traumatic. Uh, it was from age 17 to 32, so my formative years. So it, you know, I, I had psychological after effects. Uh, I used to see a mental health counselor four times a week for six years. It's common for people to have post-traumatic stress disorder, panic attacks, anxiety, feeling on, uh, of uh, processing things at a slower speed and feeling of having been frozen in time. Technology was different. Uh, GPS, internet, cell phones didn't exist. Cities and towns didn't look the same any, anymore. I was released without anything, so I, you know, I lacked stability of housing. I bounced around from place to place. I nearly ended into a homeless shelter. Um, it was very lonely trying to rebuild a social life. There was still a stigma. You had been incarcerated for 16 years wrongfully. Yes, but you've been incarcerated for 16 years. So how much of that rubbed off on you? Is it uh, actually safe to be alone anywhere uh, with you? So all those things, uh, all those difficulties simultaneously, along with uh, never always being passed over for gainful employment, so things were difficult financially, it all can be encapsulated by uh, this photo. Uh, this is when I started the organization, Jeffrey Gaspard Foundation for Justice. First person we freed was William Lopez, who did uh, 23 and a half years prior to us uh, helping to exonerate him with his legal team. Uh, he passed away after a year and a half of being free. Second case we won was William Hall, he who did eight years and four months in an, an arson case that was actually an electrical uh, fire. This is an example of doing a presentation internationally. Uh, so, and then uh, this is when I got the uh, Public Sector Serving of Justice Award. This is uh, the, the team in Pennsylvania. The tall fellow was Drew Whitley, who did 20 years prior to being exonerated by DNA. Next to him is Terrence Lewis, who did 21 years and seven months. And to my left is Mark Whitaker, who did seven years, excuse me, 17 years and four months. Uh, wrongful conviction is actually a fight against, uh, it's about accuracy and justice. It's not against the police per se. It, it is against rogue cops and cops who don't obey the laws, rules, and regulations. But as to officers who do their job, you know, properly, uh, no issues with them, uh, or prosecutors who do their job in, in the right way. Uh, in a larger sense, wrongful conviction is about is a really it's a, a public safety issue because each time the actual perpetrator uh, is every time the wrong person wrong, is in prison, then the actual perpetrator is free to strike again. So this is one of the mm -hmm. class of police officers that I had instructed. Uh, here's another here's uh, another class, a few more of them is getting the master's degree, and here's when I got the uh, law degree. So the last. A uh, portion of my presentation, I'm going to talk about wrongful conviction, uh, causes and reforms. Uh, videotaping uh, interrogations is very important is in terms of uh, fighting false confessions, which has been the cause of wrongful conviction in 25% of the DNA proven wrongful convictions, particularly vulnerable populations are youth and people with mental health uh, issues. Beyond the videotaping, which is supposed to be continuous with the camera focused in on both the uh, officer as well as the uh, as well as the suspect, uh, allowing false confession expert testimony into the courtroom for them simply to share information about what's been proven to have caused some people falsely confess. Uh, misidentification is the leading cause of wrongful conviction, 75% DNA proven wrongful convictions. Uh, the reforms there would include the double blind method, the officer doing the lineup shouldn't know who suspected. There should be no congratulatory statement if an identification is made. The process should be videotaped. Uh, every, there should be one person shown at a time. Uh, it's called uh, sequential viewing rather than simultaneous. Everybody in the lineup should be sample description given by the witness. 
uh, the witness would be told that the actual criminal may not be in the lineup and that the investigation will continue if no identification is made. Um, and lastly, a confidence statement, you know, how confident is the witness of their identification? Lying informants have been the cause of wrongful conviction and 15% of the DNA proven wrongful convictions. The reform in this area is simply that uh, there should be, nobody should be convicted based only on an informant. Bad lawyering is a major cause of wrongful conviction. Uh, some of the, uh, I believe that there should be one statewide system in each state so that could allow there to be uh, overs that could oversight and quality control, uh, that there should be a limitation on case loads. It's not unusual for one public defender to represent uh, 100 people at the same time. And even playing field in terms of financial power and, and manpower and access to experts between the district attorney's office and the public defender's office is currently a big uh, imbalance there. Uh, preserving evidence is very important. Uh, tunnel vision, which is the, the tendency of once uh, a conclusion is made, the tendency to ignore evidence to the contrary and only, only look for evidence that supports someone's conclusion. So this has been proven to have been a problem on, on the police as well as uh, prosecutorial uh, levels. Junk science, where evidence has been accepted into courtrooms, things like bite mark evidence and footprints and tire tracks. Uh, my personal favorite, uh, dog scent testimony, where the dog is given an item from a crime scene and given an item from the suspect, and if the dog barks, that's considered to be evidence that the dog recognized the item. It would be laughable, but people have been wrongfully convicted based upon that, and particularly in Texas and in uh, Florida. Uh, forensic fraud, where dry labbing has become a sarcastic term for analysts that abandon uh, ground level truth being objective scientifically, they, they'd simply dispense with the testing and just give favorable testimony to the uh, prosecution. In terms of reintegration, I believe that people who are exonerated, and this is a problem in Florida as well, uh, when people are exonerated, they should be given immediate assistance, things like housing, um, cost of living expenses, mental health services, doctor and dental care, uh, access to public transportation, job training, job placement, classes on technology. Instead, people are simply released with nothing. And I believe that that should be provided independent of financial compensation. Uh, again, to get Floridian, uh, there's a problem in the uh, Florida compensation um, statute in which they have what's called a clean, clean hands provision, which means that if the person who's been exonerated um, either has a pre-existing criminal record on something, on something other than that, or they, they're arrested uh, subsequent to exoneration that they're not eligible for compensation. And, and I think you know, it has the net impact of depriving someone who's been wrongfully imprisoned, who's had a grievous wrong uh, visited upon them, who's gonna need mental health treatment, who's had pain and suffering, who's lost past wages and their future wages are impacted. I mean, it, 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 to me, it's just completely, it's completely unjust. So that's something that needs to be changed in Florida. Um, the reforms across the board, I mean, I'm hoping that one of the things that comes out of this a presentation tonight is that there will be probably an exploration committee, maybe uh, perhaps overseen by Professor Quinlevin, and you know we can compare the best practices I've talked about tonight and see where Floridian law is on those together a coordinated effort um, afterwards. Um, I do want to mention that uh, the. You know, the foundation, uh, we have what's called um, Patreon campaign. So it's our uh, online crowdfunding um, campaign. It's, it's for people that are willing to be recurring monthly donors. My crazy dream has always been to find 25,000 people who are willing to contribute $3 a month on a recurring monthly basis, or maybe something like five. But like for the price of a cup of coffee to get involved into, uh, freeing wrongfully convicted uh, people. And, and if we could get even just to 2,500, I mean, that would be 
on a monthly, recurring monthly basis. And I'm hoping that a lot of people on the call tonight would be willing to uh, help by way of um, word of mouth and sharing on social media and in other creative ways of getting the word out and encouraging us to get donors. If we could get to 2,500 people, that would be enough for us to expand uh, in, into, uh, into Florida and do policy work and do the same that they're doing in other states and building statewide you know, coalitions, accepting uh, people from all, all different sectors. Uh, the last thing I'll mention is um, prosecutorial misconduct is a major cause of wrongful conviction, and it's a, a factor that runs through the majority of the cases in terms of reforms. Uh, the Commission on Prosecutor Conduct uh, is definitely a reform. They have what's called prosecutorial immunity. So that means if the prosecutor withholds evidence of innocence or threatens witnesses or suborns perjury, if that happens after an arrest has been made, then you would not be able to hold them accountable in court. Uh, I think that when a prosecutor does those things and it's intentional, it's concrete, you know, we're not talking about shades of gray or an error or, or lapse in judgment, but instead intentional, clear cut, and if someone is wrongfully imprisoned, then I think that there should be a criminal penalty attached, uh, attached to that. Um, I'm going to uh, end the presentation now. I do believe that my mission in life is to fight wrongful conviction, and that's how I make sense of everything uh, that, that happened to me, and you know, the, that gives me meaning, and um, it gives me a sense of inner peace, and I want to thank everybody involved in putting the event together, and uh, who spoke earlier, and all the hidden work that goes into an event like that. So I'm going to end the presentation and open it up for Q&A. Well, thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, an amazing story, an amazing presentation, and kind of a, a, a tale of, of how we turn uh, the tide on, on policy that desperately needs to be uh, kind of remedied. Uh, we've gotten a few questions in the chat, and so what I'd like to do is kind of go through them uh, in, in kind of the order that we're getting them. And I'll just kind of read them with the, uh, the name and the, and the student's um, uh, school. Um, Andrew Jamison from the University of Florida, uh, it stated that you, you gave a false, you state that you gave a false confession to the police uh, after being coerced. With the recent push for criminal justice reform, one, do you think laws concerning police interrogation should be changed directly? And if so, um, what would you consider from priority standpoint um, uh, those needing to be fixed? Yeah, in terms of, so in terms of um, false confessions, I mean, I think requiring videotaping mm -hmm. from beginning from beginning to end, uh, particularly care should be given to people with mental health issues and youth. Uh, there's been some discussion by the New York State Legislature as an example, and they're considering raising the age uh, of somebody who can be interrogated um, without a parental figure there. Certainly at 16 years old, I did not understand my rights. Mm -hmm. I didn't, uh, it wasn't, there was no way to make a knowing intelligent, uh, knowing intelligent and voluntary waiver, which is what the legal uh, standard is. So I think that those things are priority. Uh, I do want to mention that one of the things I explained to the police officers at the academy, I, I do consider the police to be the first line of defense in preventing wrongful conviction in the sense that if they don't arrest the wrong person, then the train never pulls out of the station. Uh, I do think police reform is extremely uh, important. Uh, I think we shouldn't forget about prosecutorial misconduct. And the last thing I want to say is that while I certainly favor uh, a police reform, you know, I, I personally am against uh, the movement of defund the police. I mean, I want, when I call 911, I want an all, I don't want, I don't want to go on hold. And I want a police officer to show up. I don't want a social worker showing up. I do think that the police do need to receive more training with respect to dealing with uh, people who may be going through a mental health Great. crisis. Great, absolutely. Um, second question uh, from Andrew Thompson, a political science major at Florida Southern. Uh, how can we get Congress, especially in such a divided political climate, to support legislation that, that would help to prevent more wrongful convictions? By positioning wrongful conviction and broader criminal justice reform as bipartisan. As an example, in New York State, when we were able to pass the Commission on Prosecutor Conduct, 
we had uh, a bill sponsor who was uh, who was a Democrat, and we also had a, a bill sponsor who was Republican. So I think that uh, being able to get bill sponsors from both political parties and building consensus and you know positioning the issue as nonpartisan is essential because that way you know, your momentum doesn't doesn't die depending upon which way the political wind uh, blows. So I think that those things. Uh, I think that those things are important. Great. Uh, one from uh, Darlene Antoine with Florida Atlantic University. Uh, what advice would you give to college students who are interested in pursuing a, a career or policy work in criminal justice, policy or reform? Yes, uh, I, I would. I would encourage them to learn more about uh, learn more about wrongful conviction. Uh, there's a lot of good books out there. There's uh, the National Register of Exoneration is a good mm -hmm. website to familiarize yourself with, as well as the Innocence Project. But I really quickly want to mention that there are a lot of ways to get involved in the Innocence Movement uh, of a lot of different types of careers. So there's the obvious ones, uh, being an attorney, an investigator, a paralegal. But there's uh, other there's a role, for example, for uh, researchers and and, pub and writing scholarly papers. And then within the nonprofit context, there's other disciplines that lend themselves that are essential for example grant writing fundraising social media working on working on websites uh there's certainly a place for people who want to be involved in the reintegrative end a uh, reintegrative end of it um psychologists uh social workers uh so you can write you can do podcasts or write blogs or do documentaries or docu-series all that's raising awareness there's investigative reporting there's uh, just writing articles on, on right, just doing regular reporting. I mean, your beat is whatever it is, but occasionally you write about uh, wrongful conviction work. So there's an, issues and cases. So all of those things are ways that people can get involved. And I do hope that people consider to have careers uh, in, the, in the innocence uh, movement. And for those on the call who are going to go on to become lawyers, uh, in the course of your life, I encourage you just to do just one, just one wrongful conviction case uh, pro bono. Uh, if you go on to doing policy work from in the nonprofit sphere, or if you want to be like a legislative aide to an elected official, or if you run for office yourself, that's another way of, of doing the job. Hey, just be a cop. Do it by the book. Don't look the other way. Do things the right way. Same thing in terms of being a prosecutor or, or, or a judge. I mean, we need to bring everybody together, everyone on the same page, and that way we can move towards justice. And that's that's the commonality, I think, that run through all of those uh, careers and perspectives. Um, a question from Ian Keller with Jacksonville University. Uh, what process do you go through when working with a client to determine if you're going to take it on and if they're innocent, and how does that work? Sure. So we ask for certain limited legal documents. So we have somebody fill out a questionnaire, give us information about their case. We ask them to give us copies of the police reports, copy of lab reports, if any, and we get the direct appeal brief from the prosecution and the defense. And we ask ourselves uh, two questions. Number one, do we believe that the applicant has at least a uh, plausible claim of innocence based on something objective? We look at what was used as evidence in light of known red flags around other types of evidence uh, proven as such in the DNA exoneration cases. So we ask ourselves, do we believe in the innocence claim and number two, do we see a potential route to victory? So we keep in mind the legal standards. So on an actual innocence claim, the legal standard is, um, you know, can you prove by clear and convincing evidence that the applicant is innocent? And on a newly discovered evidence claim, the standard is, would this new evidence probably have, probably have resulted in a different uh, verdict? So when we look at what investigative lines there are to play, which lines we're actually gonna be betting on in the course of the investigation, you know, we ask, well, assuming this all broke right, would this be enough to meet either of those legal, uh, either of those legal standards? What are the odds that these would break right? And frankly, what is what is the time cost and financial cost of running all these things down? And so we we, we make a, a decision by consensus, taking all those factors into account. And we certainly don't believe that everybody writing us that claims to be innocent is innocent. We're not naive, but we also recognize that. Uh, as of a few days ago, there was 2,688 proven wrongful convictions per the National Register of Exoneration. So we know that, you know, there are in fact quite a few people who are wrongfully in prison. Great. A uh, question from Daniel Elliott with uh, Rollins College. Uh, based on your experience, uh, do you think that there exists a racial bias with regard to uh, folks like yourself who are wrongfully, uh, wrongfully convicted? 
Yeah, there's definitely a racial bias. I mean, racial bias wasn't a factor in my case. I'm pretty much as white as you can get. Um, that having been said, um, you know, uh, somebody who's black is seven times as likely to be wrongfully convicted of a, of a murder, and they're three and a half times more likely to be uh, wrongfully convicted of a sexual assault, multiple stats per the National Register of Exoneration. So certainly uh, the bias there uh, com comes into play. And then one other aspect of it, which crosses over into uh, misidentification and that cross-racial identification is particularly problematic. So uh, a witness um, identifying somebody of, of a different race, I mean, there is even has a higher possibility of being uh, inaccurate. Uh, did you, um, Dr. Quinlivan, would you like to add anything to that last point since that's your specialty? Uh, yeah, the exact number for the cross-racial identification is that you're 1.56 times more likely to identify someone um, of a different race incorrectly than of your own mm -hmm. race. Well, um, there's one here. I I'm not sure if it's from a student, but I like the question because I can actually uh, speak a little bit to this as well. But uh, for either of you, uh, from Melinda uh, Prunty or Prunty, uh, is there a template for legislation that would address any or all of uh, the points that you've uh, you've raised? Yeah, there is. I mean, the Innocence Project they have um, they have sample uh, legislation, so that's one source of it. Another thing is you know looking at bills from other states that have passed it. So all these different causes are a problem in all the states across the board. There is no one state that has codified through legislation all these best practices that we're talking about. So um, there's one element or another missing either from each part or it's good on some parts, not on the others. But I think looking at the best of each part, you know, would be what, what, you, would, uh, what you would look for. The other thing that I would point to in that are two groups that uh, do quite a bit of work legislatively. One is the American Legislative Exchange Council, and the other is the National Conference of State Legislatures. Uh, both of those uh, national organizations work with legislators in all 50 states, and at least at ALEC, they have an entire criminal justice task force that works on what we call model, uh, model policy, model legislation that states can use and adopt and kind of tailor to meet their specific needs. So it's an, it's an excellent question and one where you don't necessarily have to recreate the wheel if you're a policymaker or you're working with a policymaker and you wanna share uh, the idea. Um, exactly, I, I mean, can I just piggyback on, on off that point? I agree with you completely. And this ties into another question before about uh, legislat legislative work being bipartisan. I think in working in coalition and pitching the tent as big as you can. I think that that's, uh, I think that that's very important. And look, I don't believe in purity tests one way or the other. So I work with who I can work with, when I can work with them on the issue that I can work with them. And you know, that I focus in on that, not, not everything else. So I think that's another way of, of, of keeping wrongful conviction working in a bipartisan fashion. And that's really what's more effective. Just like working in coalition, I mean, the era of going it alone it is over, that it's much easier for us to be ignored. I do believe mm -hmm. there's strength in numbers. Dr. Quinlobin, anything there? That I couldn't tell if you wanted to add in or... Uh, you're on mute. I do this all the time. That's all right. Um, no, I was just agreeing um, with Jeff. So at uh, Florida Southern College, for example, after, you know, dealing with COVID and everything, we're finally getting to a point where we are going to extend his coalition to Florida Southern College. We have students who have been trained and will continue to be trained on how to go through casework and to kind of help us out as part of class credit and internship um, to look at these cases in Florida and, and to see, you know, document everything and see where we can help. And I'm really, really excited about it. And for the other universities that are here, maybe it's something that you would want to consider because um, like Jeff was saying, you know, it's power in numbers. Uh, one that came in that I really like uh, just a moment ago, and I'm going to ask it to you, uh, Jeff, and then I've got a comment as well, but from Jordan, a nursing student at Florida Southern, are there any rules in place for minors? And do you feel there should be more, especially since you didn't know what was going on at the time that you were uh, going through it? Well, one, one rule is um, that uh, is below 16 is not, they're not allowed to question police without, uh, police are not allowed to question um, suspects without a parent. Uh, I don't think that that's enough because I mean, at 16, who understands their rights? I think that it should be higher 
in terms of putting a numerical figure on it, I mean, I don't really have a number because it would seem arbitrary to simply say 18, 20, 21, or it, it just seems a little bit arbitrary. So I'm not going to put an exact number. I do know that the age needs to be uh, needs to be raised. One of the things that I'll point to as well in this is it's an area that I've been working in uh, over my years at JMI, and that's in the issue of uh, what, what is technically called direct filing, but it basically means children that are put into the adult criminal justice system. And right now, that system is in place where a prosecutor can make the determination to charge a, a child as young as 13 as an adult for particular offenses. And there are wide disparities across uh, judicial circuits in the state of Florida. Um, the judge in most cases doesn't have the ability to kind of step in and be a judge and kind of discern whether or not uh, the, the child in place really should be charged as an adult. And you've had um, cases of, of prosecutors attempting to charge uh, 13, uh, and in one case, actually a 12 year old uh, who had been through some pretty traumatic instances uh, of abuse and mental trauma uh, as adults and those kinds of things. Uh, we've worked on reforms at the state level to try and uh, bring those to bear, but that's something as well. Yeah, uh, speaking to that, I think that, uh, you know, I, I oppose the, the process of, um, you know, charging children as adults. I mean, the U.S. Supreme Court recognized that, you know, youth, that their, their brains are not fully, uh, not fully developed mm -hmm. and they're, they're more susceptible to being spontaneous in peer pressure. You know, I, I think, you know, maybe we should think about maybe at age 23, someone's a lot more mature. Maybe at that, that's the point, perhaps, where they're charged at, at, as adults and you know, and downward would be would be less. And again, that's not saying that anybody's going to get away with a crime. It simply means that you know we're going we're going to sentence people a, a, as adults. You know that that are more uh, intentional, more present, more of a deliberate act rather than you know people who are susceptible to other things associated with uh, youth and and other factors which I've mentioned. And it also takes into account whether or not a, uh, a child has the capacity or the fact that a child has the capacity to rehabilitate more than someone who is in their 20s or 30s committing a similar offense. Uh, we are about out of time. So I wanted to end on this last question. Uh, and it's one that, you know, really we want to give you the opportunity to, to give us an idea. You've got 100, uh, you had a, we had up to, upwards of 140 some folks attending. How can those individuals that have been listening and watching you this evening help you in preventing others uh, and kind of uh, staying the course? How can they, what can they do uh, from tonight on that might assist you in this, in this kind of journey? Yeah, certainly the, uh, yeah, our effort at, um, you know, our effort at trying the crowdfunding campaign is, is really big. It's not, it, it's not free. It's not cheap to do this type of uh, to, to do this type of work, and so if we can do what we do now just on a shoestring, then if we really had uh, you know a, a budget to really uh, hire more personnel, then we could be even more effective. So I think that would be the biggest thing. I'm going to put the link to the Patreon um, site uh, in, right. the, in in the chat. I put my email address, and look, you don't you you don't need to follow up with me in order to help the, the campaign uh, go, go forward. I mean, just, you know, just keep it ethical, keep it legal. If you want help and guidance, I'm happy to provide that, but, you know, don't wait for me. The whole key is we got to get out of my network and get into lots of the networks of many other people. Look, my dream is to have uh, a chapter in each state and ultimately in each country. I would love nothing better than to have a chapter of the Descovic Foundation down there in Florida. So beyond just doing the policy work, you know, being able to um, help on the exonerated end. Um, so, I mean, you know, those things that unfortunately it takes money to do that, but uh, I'm enthusiastic for it. And, you know, it's a definitely a way that people can help. And maybe some of the students will think about having student groups and maybe once a month you show a documentary or movie on wrongful conviction. And, you know, that, that would be one thing and have a speaker series. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to, to, to get involved. And again, people can reach me through the chat if they want to pick my brain for ideas, but great. Dr. Quinlivan, any uh, parting thoughts before we, uh, we say adieu? No, um, I don't really have anything else to add. I, I, but I really do believe that students do want to get involved. And so I don't know how many of you out there are professors, but I've had a wonderful response to uh, working with Jeff and, you know, starting this coalition at Florida Southern College. So I encourage you 
because a lot of students are interested in, in this type of work. Or if you're a student, maybe approach your professor if you have a professor who, who does wrongful convictions or something like that. So. Absolutely. And uh, we are with that out of time. I would like to thank Jeff and, and Dr. Quinlevin. Uh, can't thank you enough for your time, your energy, your efforts to those of you who have participated tonight. On behalf of the staff of the James Madison Institute, I'd like to thank you for joining. We look forward to bringing uh, more programming to you. And uh, please reach out to us if you can and, and give us uh, any uh, advice or thoughts that you may have on other programming that you'd like to see. And we will, uh, we will see you very, very soon. Thank you very much and have a great evening.